often. I've got like half people, so I guess half good. Uh, but today I just want to share with you some real lessons that I've picked up over the last sort of 10 years of coaching. Uh, and being in business as well, because we're all in business, like it or not, we have to accept that. Um, so I'm going to share with you some, uh, some, some stuff that I picked up from the best athletes that I've been fortunate to work with, some of the best coaches, and just in general, some of the best programs that I've been a part of. Um, you can find me on Twitter, and I'm not against pictures, you can just get as many pictures out as long as you tag me in, that's the only caveat. Um, so, a little bit, little bit about me, um, I've been coaching around about 10 years now. I started off as a martial artist, and before I got into strength and conditioning, that was where I wanted to go. I did a lot of mixed martial arts, Thai boxing, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I still do. Um, but uh, when I got into my master's degree, I did a master's in strength and conditioning, I really kind of fell for that, I really found the passion there. And ever since, it's just been, I've thrown myself headfirst into strength and conditioning, and I love it. Uh, I, I worked with the English Institute of Sport with the GB Rowing Programme. I worked with Huddersfield Giants for the Super League Rugby. Um, I worked with the Asylum Valley Judo team, which is an MMA team that's one of the top teams in the UK, still to support those guys. Uh, I've worked with British Tennis, and at the moment I've, I run my company, which is Strength and Conditioning Education, where Rachel has ever put courses on and things like that for people. Um, at the moment, my consultancy work is I work with England Golf, I work with the Talent Athletic Sponsorship Scheme, and a load of other things. But that doesn't mean I'm anything special, it just means I've put myself out there and gone and got it. I'm no better than anybody else, and I'm, I'm certainly not the smartest person in this room, shy dot over there in the corner of the Martin. Um, but, uh, you know, I've just gone out there and got it, and I want to try and share some of those things with you today. So, two things to cover. I want to share these lessons with you, and I'm going to water those down into what I class the P's of performance. But the real P's of performance. We've got planning, we've got physiology, we've got punctuality, we've got all that kind of stuff. That's important, but what I want to share with you is what I believe is the true essence of the building athletes, building a programme, building your own coaching career. Uh, and then I'll finish with just some tips or kind of lessons that I picked up on how to be a successful coach and how to build a successful business. So hopefully you'll get at least one or two things that you can take away at the end of this session. And my biggest challenge is going to be sticking to the time. So uh, I'm going to raise on. Um, for me, it's all about success. It's like, like, how do you be a successful coach? How can you make things happen? How can you get great results? And um, what is the key to coaching success? So I want to start with a, a, a question, actually. I want to ask you guys a question and tell you a story. So here's, here's the question. Okay, what's the connection between the following professions? All right, that's me teaching a weightlifting class. That represents strength and conditioning or biomechanics with role coaches here. That represents fitness coaching, okay? Here's the second profession. This represents the boardroom, the business environment, okay? And here's the third one, this little fella here. This represents anything like from a trade background, a, um, a skilled craftsman, okay? What's the connection? Please volunteer any ideas or thoughts. Skill? Goal in mind. Yeah? You've all got a goal, yeah? They're all doing a job. Sorry? They're all doing a job. They're all doing a job and, we're, and they all possess skills and we've learned those skills in the specific educational pathway that we've been through. But for me, the connection is this. The key to success in all of those professions that we've just identified is the relationships with the people that are in your environment. Okay, And that is paramount. Above the sets and the reps. Above the, 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 the nuts and bolts that we all learn. It's the relationships. And the thing about relationships is when you first meet someone, you see these things. You, see, you hear words, you see how people move, the body language. That's what we get straight away. But it's taking the time to get beneath the surface where we feel about where we see the beliefs and the values. The fears, those are the things that get the long-term results. But we can't get to beneath the surface without putting effort and time in. And you have to put them both in. You can't just make effort and expect it to happen overnight. And you can't just expect it to happen without effort in a limited amount of time. You've got to put both of those things in. And that is where we get the results with our clients. So for me, this talk is going to reflect on the <coughs> coaching side of our profession. Uh, it's going to be some nuts and bolts, but it's more about relationships. 
And this is a good slide that I borrowed from one of my mentors, Bernd Gambetta. It's not about X's and O's, it's about Jimmy's and Joe's. And we've got to keep that in our minds at all times, those relationships. So here's the next thing. I'm going to tell you a story now. Okay? And this story is called the 10,000 kilogram challenge. And um, this is what you've got to do, right? You've got to do 10,000 kilograms of front squats. I'm a strength conditioning coach, we love squats. One of my mentors, a mutual friend of ours, friend in very commerce, said to me one time, he says, you can do any exercise you want to do as long as you've got squats in there as well. So that's just something that I've, I've uh, kind of carried on. So that's your first thing. Then you've got to do 100 chin-ups. Then you've got to do 200 box jumps. It keeps going. You've got to do 200 press-ups, 200 core exercises, the lectures. Hey, and I'll tell you what, we'll throw in 200 lunges as well. And you've got to do that in 45 minutes. Russell, you up for that? Feel it? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's just a classic <laughs> Russell Payne word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tough challenge for everyone, isn't it? That we, we can see that that would be a very difficult thing. How do we get through that in 45 minutes? Any ideas? Get you not to do it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's pretty much it. <laughs> it's a trick question. You've got to work as a team. You've got to work as a team. And that is an exact session that I gave to my performance cricketers one day. The, the session is irrelevant. What the, what the conversation, the point is, is why you do that, right? Why would I, as a professional strength and conditioning coach, rip up my program for one session to give them something crazy like that to do? Okay, why? Yes, exactly. Because it's about people, it's about relationships. Because what had happened, one week prior to this session, I was in Scotland doing a presentation, I was tutoring up there for the, United, for the UK Strength and Conditioning Association. And I got a text from, I got, sorry, I got two or three phone calls from the head cricket coach, Andrew Lawson. And he rings me a lot and he leaves like four minute voicemails, so I just binned them usually, I just pressed delete, delete, delete. Um, but this particular day, he kept, kept ringing, and then uh, I was in my, I was listening to somebody else's talk actually, and I got a text through, and the text read, Can you call me now? Tommy Harden has passed away. Okay? Tommy was the captain of that team, and um, a big influence on the group and a personal kind of, he was going to be one of my interns, he was going to be one of my assistants. So that is why I ripped up the program because the value of those relationships, the value of those people that you're dealing with in your program is so integral to the success of that program. So now we call that the Hartman Challenge, uh, which is a pretty cool name, let's be honest, isn't it? The Hartman Challenge. So if you want to take that Hartman Challenge on, you can do that and let me know how you get on. So, key to coaching success is the people and the relationships. And um, I want to take you through the real piece of performance now. And uh, we know about planning, we know about physiology, we know about all those things because we learn them. These are the things that really value, that really have value. And the first one is the people. We've just discussed that. And this is my, um, this is a, a team that I work with called Goldball, where they're all visually impaired. And uh, I started consulting with British Goldball a couple of years ago, and we were in Turkey at this point. We've been to Turkey to, the, to compete the European Championships. And it's pretty cool because the girls have kind of put a lot of effort in over the last um, six months of working with me. But they didn't care about the program. They didn't give a crap about that. They just cared that I cared. They just cared that I was putting in the time to support them with their work. And that classic uh, statement, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You've got to demonstrate that. You've got to give them a hug, <coughs> Russell said, uh, on a regular basis. So that's the first thing. And um, hopefully you'll be able to hear this. This is some advice from a coach called John Wooden, who's widely revered to be one of the top coaches in the world. He was a, he was a basketball coach in the States, passed away now. Uh, but just some really good advice on... Teaching basketball is just like teaching math or English or something else. You have to understand the individuals under your supervision. Uh, they give them the treatment. They earn and deserve. You won't like them all the same. They won't like you all the same. 
love them all the same and let them come to know through the time that you do care for them as individuals and not just because they're athletes or ball players for you. As individuals, be interested in their personal life, be interested in their family and so on. And you can't just tell them that, you have to really show them that. And if you do, they will respond in my opinion. So as my dad said, never try to be better than somebody else. Learn from others because you'll never know a thing that you don't learn from somebody else. And never cease trying to be the best you can be. Uh, but I think for the most part, my basic philosophy uh, would stay the same. The main thing is not X's and O's. It's, it's the three things that are hard, in the heart of my fear. Get them in the best possible condition. Teach them to not only proper, but quickly to execute the fundamentals and insist that they play together as a team. And I think that would be true 50 years ago, and I think it would be true 50 years from now. Those are the main ingredients you need. Simple stuff, right? Simple stuff. Really good advice. And, and they actually did a study which I thought would be quite interesting to, to share with you about effective coaching and getting your points across. And what they did was they followed John for a week and they observed 2,300 acts of teaching in that time. And within those 2,300 acts, the breakdown was 75% pure information. Okay, so no crap, no, it's just all just bang on, on target. And then within that 75%, they made observations that they were short, they were punctuated, and if one didn't work, try a different one. So if you're getting bad feedback from your clients or athletes that you don't understand, that's not their fault, that's your fault. Because you've got to change the message that you give them to try and get that understanding. <coughs> and then within that, they said all of these things were 20 seconds or, long, or, or uh, less. And uh, you know, we all make these mistakes of like, over-coaching, giving people too many things to think about. Uh, but really it's about giving them short, concise information and giving them really good feedback based on how they execute those, that, those, that information that you've given them. So that's the, uh, the first thing. The second thing is your purpose. What are you in this for? And I think all of these things that I'm talking about now are um, really effective for your clients and your athletes that you're working with, but also effective for us as coaches as well. So why are we here? What, what's our purpose? Why are we coaching? Um, but, but so often, the athletes I work with just crack on like machines, um, but they don't always understand the purpose of, of why they're doing something. So for me, it's all about starting with why. Okay, and this is a great book that I'd recommend you check out. <coughs> this guy's all over Facebook at the moment, and he's, he's just, he just bangs out really good stuff all the time. Um, but he's, he's, he talks about the value of this, of why. So, Here's a statement that a lot of strength and conditioning coaches would utter in the gym. They'd get their boys in, they'd say, Right fellows, we're doing deadlifts today. Work on keeping your chest out. Um, let's get some serious weight on the bar. Off you go. Right? I've done it myself. Totally, you know, that's whatever. But what have I done there? I've told them what they were doing. I've told them actually how to do it. Keep your chest out. But I have not touched on the most integral part, why? Why would they put their effort in? Why would they give intent and, uh, and do that purposefully if they don't understand? Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do something unless somebody said that to me and said, this is why you're doing that. I was listening to a podcast with a guy called Tim Ferriss on the way up here. People heard of him, four-hour working weekend. And um, he said that he um, at school he got told he was borderline dyslexic because he didn't learn, he didn't know the alphabet uh, and he didn't understand why but then he, he said like he said it came out later but nobody had explained to him that if he could learn the alphabet he'd be able to read and he'd be able to read books and educate himself he didn't have the why he just had the what and um, so in your own coaching in your own environments there's probably examples myself included of where you could probably do a better job with why people are doing things and, why, and what the value is for them. Okay? And um, here's two guys, here's two, oh, actually a girl and a guy, who've got some great purpose for what they do. This is Danny Mitchell, one of my athletes, a UFC fighter, and uh, he, he knows why he's doing it. He's a UFC, he wants to be in the UFC, he wants to be a champion. He has a quality that I refer to as RPV. He relentlessly pursues improvement. Okay, relentless. 
and he knows that it's not going to be a straight line. There's going to be some ups and downs along the way, and that's okay. But he's relentless with his pursuit of improvement. Here's another one of my athletes, Fontaine. She was a chronic injury case for three years when I first started working with her. And I've been working with her for six years. And I'll be honest, like the first couple of years, I genuinely thought, this is an athlete that I'm going to really struggle to take forward with, with whatever she's trying to do. Uh, I thought she was just chronically <coughs> going to be in and out of rehab. And, um, but one thing that happened, or one thing that was part of this process, was she never missed a session. She always had the purpose. She always was consistent with it. And six, three years after that kind of bad injury period, she's top 50 in the world now at badminton. She's just in the semi-finals today in one of the equivalents of like Wimbledon. You know, it's called the Super Series in badminton. Um, and she's just amazing. She's awesome. She just never stops. She's got it. She's got RPB. She's got that relentless pursuit of better. But what this means for us is, if we're training people who want to get better, if we're training people who want to improve, we have to have the drive to, to, to keep up. Because if we don't stay on top of our game, we're not going to have those solutions and those answers and be that guide and that mentor that they need. So purpose, for me, is maybe the most important thing. And the, set, the next one is the path that you follow, or the philosophy that you have as a coach. And I want to share with you a couple of my main mentors now, which are the things that they basically helped me to understand. And this guy called Vern Gambetta. And uh, Vern talks about training. We need, we need to look at fluency. We're not just training robots. We're not just doing presses or you know, deadlifts that are really stiff and, and just solid, like isolated movements in that way. We've got to think about fluency and linking things together. The godfather of functional training, you might call him. He's probably coined that term. He talks about training being mindful and not mindless. So we need to create thought and stimulate thoughts why we're doing something and, and, uh, and, and a solution to that. And we're trying to, what the goal of our programs is, is, is to develop adaptable athletes or adaptable clients. We want people who can solve problems, who can come up with solutions and not just give them the solutions. Why is a cockroach still on this earth and a dinosaur isn't? Because the cockroach is adaptable. They have adapted <coughs> to every single environment that they've been presented with for millions, maybe billions of years. And dinosaurs were adapted to their environment. What we're trying to do is give people answers that they can adapt to different environments and make them adaptable athletes. And um, one of the last things that Vern really kind of emphasizes, and I'm a, a, a true believer in this, is you have to build the quality before you can learn to endure it. So we're talking periodization and planning, I don't want to get into too much depth, but really, how can you produce strength endurance or power endurance unless you've got strength or power in the first place? You cannot endure a quality you do not possess. You have to build that quality first. And um, this is some stuff that I really like about fluency. These are two guys, you may have heard of them, Ido Portal and Jimmy Nielsen, uh, both from opposite ends of the earth, but actually coming up with quite similar stuff. I'm going to play this for a few seconds. The music's the best bit. <laughs> There's no real structure, there's no real pattern, there's no real coaching. It's just fluent, nice movement that a lot of people can benefit from in their programs, you know. I, I fully believe this. Um, so check those two guys out. And, um, and this is an example of one of my elite athletes, little Katie Morton, she's 12, uh, doing some what I believe is mindful training. Okay? Uh, I'm going to play the clip, but essentially what she's done, this is the first time she's ever seen this stuff. All right, now of course she jumped over hurdles before, but the exercise is, the way I've structured it, is the first time ever she's seen it. So she's got to hop over the little ones, jump over the big ones and solve this problem. This is our gym, we just set this up and make, and she's got to find a way through it. Okay, now it progresses a little bit, this is her sister Emily, she'll do the same. And that, what I do is I get them to set it up for each other. So it kind of messes up a little bit and they've got to find a way through. 
And then this is, this is another one that they've set up a little bit, same thing, you've got to, go, you've got to adapt to it, you've got to go hopping and jumping, it's a bit crazy. And then she's set one up for her sister, Katie's got to find a solution to that. And there's another session, and I just literally put these hurdles out for us and find your way through, get it done. And that's our old man on the rower, and he's not getting involved. <laughs> so I'm going to line some of your toes around this one. Well, stuff, good. Change leg. And then. Um, What's more around? And just to kind of make this real time, I think I should change it up now. And so. She has to deal with it real time. Let's do this real time and just shift some. Well, this was about two years ago. <laughs> so she has to find the solution to so this problem, this movement puzzle. Um, so that's, that's a good example for me of actually making people think about what you do. It's a good example of, of plyometrics appropriate for a younger age as well. Uh, she's earned the right to, to graduate to that stuff. Um, here's another guy that's been a big influence on me, a guy called Kelvin Giles. A few things that I want to share with you about Kelvin's philosophy and, and some of the things that has helped me. It's all about being brilliant at the fundamental movements. The ability to squat, lunge, push, pull, brace, rotate, and then do it all together, integrate it. It's not about sport-specific movements. The goal for me, in my environment, is to be a specialist in general training. To suit that training to the individual in due course, but essentially for them to earn the right to progress to sport-specific movements. It's all about problems, and then individuals finding solutions to problems. And actually, from a coaching perspective, less is more. They've got to find solutions. They've got to think those neuro, neuromuscular pathways have got to be absolutely firing and we give people movement problems. And from a sport-specific perspective, we've got to get the physical <coughs> right. Then we've got to get the, the technical right, the technical sport skills. And then, finally, we can think about the tactical stuff. And when we condition athletes, it's tough, tough, and duff. All right? Technique under fatigue, skills under fatigue, decision making under fatigue. When we look at sports, injuries occur when you're fatigued. They don't occur when you're fresh. So we've got to replicate that in our training. There's a divide from being able to do a single leg hold really nicely um, like this and then doing some agility drills and then holding that single leg. And that's what we've got to replicate in our training. Technique skills and decision making and fatigue, tough conditioning we call it. And um, just to illustrate the movement puzzle thing, what, what we deal with normally in training programs is something that looks like this. We give people something that's a similar problem each time. Two plus two equals four. And we keep repping that and we keep demanding the same answers and the same responses. Maybe when they get good we change it a little bit. And then we maybe change it again. But sport and life, inverted commas, is not like that. We've got to replicate the realities of these different problems that hit us on the sports field, in the gym, in life in general. And if we don't do that, we're doing a disservice to our clients by giving them the answers to simple problems and not progressing it to more complex or problem solving challenges. So here's a couple of little videos, right, that I just dug off the internet. This one is super simple, well, they're both super simple. He's got to keep that ball going whilst keeping the balloon in the air. And you know what, he's going to make errors. And he learns from those errors. <coughs> okay, and the top left, one of the best influences for, for, for movement programs, in my opinion, is parkour. Here's the problem, he's got to get through there without touching the floor, off you go. 
There's no coach, nobody telling him turn your left foot out or stick your chest out. He's just got to find the solution to this movement problem. He's like a little bit more less flexible than the other guy, isn't he? <laughs> for our clients and our athletes, the better they can be at making their own decisions and getting intrinsic feedback from those challenges. I keep going because I know it's um, And here's something that's a bit of a bugbear for me personally. Um, I'll pick these off here. The first thing, I mean, what the hell is this? Let's be honest. Um, when, I, when I presented this a month or two ago, I, I said to... I said to people, you know, the same question, there's a woman in the corner and she said it looks like S&M. And I said, I said, it's definitely not S&T, put it that way. But um, anyway, yeah, what the hell is this? And uh, this is Tiger Woods. And, and the reason I chose Tiger to illustrate this point is because there's a big difference here. And it's the expectations for us as coaches and for our athletes. I work with England Golf. And I was working, I worked with a really, really brilliant technical coach called Steve Robinson in, in the Yorkshire area with a women's program. And we were on the driving range watching all these um, swings, etc., etc. And Steve said to me about a senior player, Tour International, who's maybe 25, something like that ish. He said to me, he said, You know what, Brendan? He says, She's got exactly the same fault that she had seven years ago. She's just learned to manage them better. And that's been the difference between her, with her success. And I think we've got to understand that sometimes you've got to manage faults and sometimes you can correct them. But to chase correction, correction, correction all the time is not necessarily the right path to take. Sometimes you need to have a discussion and say, I'm going to teach you to, edu I'm going to educate you to manage these things a little bit better. It might be, um, you know, your proprioception, it might be your shoulder movement, it might be your psychology. You know, we have an impact on all of these things, but it's not necessarily the right way to just try and correct and correct. Sometimes you've just got to teach people to manage themselves more effectively. And so what we do now as a process, as a part of this is, we actually periodize or plan education into the programs. What are you going to be able to show me at the end of this four week block, not just your strength, not just your power, not just your movement, but how can you, can you teach me more about warming up and why you need to warm up in this way and why you need to warm up in this way. And that's a good educational process to teach people self-management and it's the same in business as well. You've got, to have, you've got to manage your own habits, you've got to manage your own coaching styles for different people and keep touching back at them. Um, but I think too many people are all about, we've got to correct, correct, correct. And actually, sometimes you just got to teach people to manage their, themselves more effectively. Um, so, real, this is a, a big lesson for me over the last sort of four or five years. And one of the ways that we that I try and do this is by taking the error away. And um, so, if we have a problem, let's say these two examples, um, a, a recent ones for me. This fellow here is a jiu-jitsu or judo fighter. He has a problem for going forward too much into uh, move into takedowns and even in the gym that manifests itself as he's very kind of backy on his squats. Um, so what I did was I changed I took the error away. I didn't let him experience that anymore. And it came by as a consequence of just playing with this uh, cable drill. And the same with Hannah here, she's a GB triathlete. She gets very posturally like kyphotic. And um, we wanted her to open up and be able to use her hips more. So what we do is we take the error away. We don't let her be kyphotic. We don't let him be uh, back in his squats. And here's just a couple of examples. Yeah, so the, the neck circuit, which is actually our neck conditioning, forces you to keep an upright position. So because if you don't, there's a consequence to that. Okay? And then the bottom one here, the overhead position on the squat, on the lunge, forces Hannah to keep an upright posture. And this neck circuit for Adam is a really effective way on all movements like split squats and everything like that. So to take that error away and give them the feedback, 
We look a little bit silly doing it, but <coughs> no, we don't care about that. Yeah, that's it, that's it. You want to it further out? You look like you're sort of in the middle of a stroke almost at times. But uh, once again, <coughs> yeah. but there is an example here of the consequence. If you've got an inbuilt consequence into your drill, it's a really good way of getting feedback uh, instantly to that athlete. And the music's all right as well, isn't it? <laughs> Stay upright, stays upright, stays upright, and as a consequence of doing poorly, loses it. There's your inbuilt feedback into the drill. And look, I don't have to coach him, he coaches himself. It makes our job easy. So take the error away. And, um, and then this next one is, is the place, and this is all about your performance environment. Uh, the best athletes, the best programs I've been a part of always have a, a, an amazing performance environment. And that is not linked to money. It's it's a cheap, knackered up mats, you know, woodworm in the corner of here and the old school. And you've got a 75 year old coach teaching a UFC fighter, teaching other people how to be better, how to improve. And your environment that you work in, the, the culture that you create, is absolutely imperative to getting long term results with your clients and athletes. And here's my ingredients, right? You've got to have the right people in, in there. You've got to have the right people with a shared purpose, all looking to improve, all looking to get better. You've got to have them in the right place, and you've got to have them <coughs> at the right time together. Super simple. And this is some stuff from martial arts, but it illustrates it. Everybody's equal when we're on, on the map. You've got to put your game on the line, and leave your ego at the door. There's no titles, no rituals, no hierarchies. There's no bowing and saying, my word, you are a guru. You're always going to be able to beat me, because I don't want to beat you. You've got your, everybody's on the mat. Everybody's equal, and it's the same when you're in the gym as well. You just got to get in there and grind it out. So these last few are about us as coaches, uh, what it takes, I feel, to really kind of push the boundaries and, and succeed as a, as a coach. And the first one is passion. If you haven't got that, you've finished. In fact, you haven't even started. Um, so you've got to love what you do and put yourself in places that other people are just not able to go. And this is us, we're in the Middle East, in Jordan, uh, this is Danny and this is the lad that we work with, Jay, and it's an expression of the physical work that you've done over the last year, two years. It's a special feeling, but you don't get to those, those environments and, and have those opportunities without having the passion to drive it forward when it's hard and when it's not that nice. Um, and the second thing is, is, is being present. All right, now, I don't mean turning up here, okay, that's the first, you've got to turn up. <coughs> But being present is, the, is where it starts, okay? What I mean by being present is you are there. You're 100%. If we're working together, we are working together. I'm not answering my phone. I'm not like, yeah, okay, mate. Yeah, that's fine. I'm working. We are going to get results. I'm present. I'm 100% present in that session. And that's what creates value. And that's when you can, I believe, anyway, that's when you can put your prices up, where you can deliver that five-star service that starts with you being 100% present and so I'm, I'm working with you. We are going to get better together. I'm giving you my time. Uh, no phones, nothing else. So turning up is where it starts. And my friend Nick Ward's got this nice analogy for building session. I really like it from a coaching perspective. I've got the three emails. <coughs> our sessions, our programs, have got to excite people. They've got to be like, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing this. They've got to engage you with a purpose. This is why you're doing it. And they've got to then enable them to develop by giving them those movement problems and those movement solutions. Excite them, engage them, bring them back. So we're going to do this because of this. And then give them the tools of how to do that. Really good. And then this last one is playing. You know, we all love what we do. We all love what we do. So just play and have fun. Fun is a big part of it. Now, this is my friend John Cavanagh, a great MMA coach with his aviators on, looking good. And, um, and this is our environment, the gym. This is where we create and come up with solutions for people. And uh, has anyone ever heard of a really well-regarded strength and conditioning coach called Ricky Gervais? People come across him? He, he's, he knows what he's talking about. Have a read. I 
found this in a, in a blog or on a website and I thought it works well. Because the thing for me is that creativity <coughs> with, a, with an outcome, with a need, if we know that in, in one week we've got to start something, we can create and, we, and that's the best way to develop solutions for people. Create and allow yourself to play but have an, um, a definitive time on that. You've got to get this thing ready next week. You have to have a solution by next week. So you've got to facilitate that. And play and creating is the best way to do that. And uh, this is one of my athletes, Nico. And when you go home today, everybody's going to have a go at this, including you, Russ. Ready? This is the Albania Assassin, they call him. He's uh, Albanian, actually. Box jump, backflip, burpee. Oh, yeah, the boy didn't just do one, he does six. <laughs> Misses one, but he's back. Yeah, yeah, boy. He's an MMA fighter and he, um, he's, he's a good gymnast as well. Now, of course, you've got to have excellent, you don't want laxity in the ACL here, right? That's the um, I'm not prescribing that, but it's just an example of, here's a challenge, you know, let's see if you can do it. And, and he's a gymnast, he loves to play that. And you've got to have the loud up for that, uh, that creativity and that play to happen, I think. And uh, the last one uh, here for now is, is perspective. And of course we have tragedies and things like that, but um, it's only training at the end of the day. You know, you've still got to go home. And you've still got to see your wife and kids or whoever it is. And um, you've got to keep things in perspective. And this next slide is my three, three triplet nieces and nephews. <laughs> of course, blue for boys and pink for girls. And the t-shirt is, I love daddy this much. This much. So it's pretty cool. And uh, the reason I put this slide in is one, it's super cute. But secondly, two, is because we had a, a, on one of my mentorship weekends, we had, um, uh, we put a task out to the group and we said, design the best program to optimize adaptations for a rugby player. All right? And so, they, came, they went away in their working groups and they put this program together. And one of the, one of the groups came back and said, well, we think that it's a professional sport, that we think they should be in early in the morning, they should go home at lunchtime, they should have a lunch, they should have a sleep in the afternoon, they should come back at six o'clock at night and train for two hours, okay? Because that's the best thing to optimize their strength, power, whatever adaptations, right? And that may work, well be true, um, but the discussion in the group was, well, hang on a second, he's got kids to go home to. He's got a life to lead outside the gym. Um, so for me, there is no perfect program. It's the most appropriate solution for the environment and the individual that you're working with at any time. It's the program that they can do. It's the program that they're excited and engaged <coughs> in. And it's balancing the need to do versus the nice to do and the like to do. Really, really important, I think, to remember that. So, um, last bit, if we've got time, two or three minutes, I just want to share with you a few steps to success that, that have helped me as a coach. And some of them are my own, some of them I've nicked them unashamedly from, from other people. Um, if you remember two words from my talk today, it would be, not growling, actually, that's coming up. Uh, it would be uh, pick yourself, okay? And um, it's the ability to step forward and take the opportunities when they present themselves to you. And uh, the, the growl model, has anybody heard of the grow model before? It's, um, it's a kind of coaching model that you can work with people when they're enabling them to identify their goals. So how it works is, you, you have your goals, and then there's the reality of the situation. Where are you now? Where are you now? And this is for us as well, by the way, not just our athletes. And then there's our options to get towards that goal. So how do we bridge the gap? And very important with that is how much will or how much drive we've got to make that happen. Because sometimes if you close the gap, you've got to have a hell of a lot of this stuff. It's not easy. You've got to have the drive and the will to find your way forward. So that's the grow model. If you come across that, and it's pretty common. I like the growl model, which is just a bit more bite. And all it is is just adding in what learning do you need to take it there, yeah? What learning do you need? Do you need to learn about Facebook ads? 
for example, to take you to your goals. You need to learn about advanced power training techniques to take you to your goals. But if you program in your learning, then it becomes a much easier process to say, actually, I go from A to B to C to D, and then I'm kind of halfway there, and then I reevaluate and go back through this model. Uh, and I use this sort of structure in sessions with our, our athletes and my clients, but most importantly, I do it myself. Where, how am I going to get to this to, to this part here? And what do I need on the way? And I'm sure that there'll be elements of this that are more challenging for you than, other, than others. Maybe it's the will, maybe it's the reality of accepting it. Maybe it's identifying your goals crystal clear and taking the time to do so. Because, uh, you know, that's a huge thing. Um, but growl your way to success is, uh, is a good mantra. And uh, these are the two words, pick yourself. So um, this is something from one of my, uh, an awesome author called Seth Godin. I read every one of his books cover to cover. And I always say when I talk to people in fitness or s and I would say, this guy knows nothing about coaching, but he knows everything about coaching. Because it's about people, it's about the relationships, it's about communicating and connecting with people. And he talks about, you know, this, you've got to pick yourself, right? Because nobody is ever going to come forward and say, yeah, you've got a job, you're going to get paid £100,000 a year. Brilliant. It's not going to happen. Um, I think for me, it's like when you go back to school and it's like, yeah, we're picking teams, we're picking, you know, captains. And instead of waiting to be picked, you step forward and say, I'll pick me. That's what's going to happen. I picked myself. Um, so two massive words for me when I read this book, yeah, that's happening. And when you accept that, that nobody's going to pick you, it's actually pretty cool and easier to make things happen for yourself. <coughs> Here's another four words that if you remember another four words, let them be these. If in doubt, begin. There's always going to be people saying that shit, that idea is rubbish. Uh, you're not good enough for that. Uh, you don't have enough knowledge or you, you, um, you don't have enough drive or whatever, there's always going to be the doubt in your mind before you get started with the project. And if it's there, you should use it and get started anyway. Um, if in doubt, begin. And I'm sure like lots and lots of people have said it in different ways, but for me it's huge because you just got to smash through that resistance that is inevitably there and, uh, and make things happen for yourself. And as we know, steel sharpens steel. So being in this room today with like-minded people is huge uh, because you're socialising with people who've got a common purpose and a drive. But steel sharp and steel, if you allow yourself to associate with people who aren't on the same wavelength as you, it's going to drag you down. And you want to be in an environment where people are going to drag you up. You work together because it's that common purpose. And, uh, and surround, make intentions to surround yourself with really, really great people. I'm sure that's an easy sell because we're all here in this room today. And, um, and this is quite cool as well, being a purple cow, right? So if you're driving home today and you may or may not pass a number of fields on your way back and there happens to be some cows in those fields, what are you going to do? Just drive on? Yeah? Nothing special. If you see a purple cow, <laughs> you're going to slam on those brakes. You're going to stop and take a look at that cow. And then you're going to say, I just saw a purple cow. <laughs> but you know what? That's what we've got to be as practitioners, as coaches. We've got to be this purple cow. The person, the practitioner, that other people say, wow, she is absolutely superb. He is unbelievable. Good is not good enough anymore. You've got to be a purple cow. You've got to be outstanding at what you do and remarkable at what you do. Worthy of making a remark, of somebody else making a remark, remarkable. And moving your business, you're moving your career, moving everything forward every day. I watched The American Office. Anyone else, anyone else watch that? It's funny, right? It's really funny. Um, but um, in one of the latest series, uh, the new CEO was in the office and she and they're all trying to go at five o'clock right everybody's trying to get off at five o'clock and she's there typing away in the office and so they're all like kind of oh, can we shoot off and eventually she says sure you can go if you can hang your hat on today and say you've taken things forward if you can hang your hat on the day then you are welcome to go 
But I'm saying <coughs> that the till list is done because I can't hang, hang my hat on today yet. And I really like that. Uh, for me, it's simple. You've got to take your business, your career, your development process forward every day. Every day. Maybe not some days. I don't know. It depends how committed you are to work. I don't know. Seven days a day. So every day. And whatever you do, just go all in. If you've got a goal to achieve something, just can smash it. Go and get it done. Nobody stops you. Go all in. Put your chips in. Because if you leave some back, you're not, you're not putting all your mental clarity and energy into a project. Big, big thing for me. And this is it, you know. This is it. We're all, we all love what we're doing. Just get it done. So thank you, appreciate you listening. We've got a lot to cover there. Be, be sure to go and build something. Um, I want to give a shameless plug to my book. It is available. And it is not expensive. It's £1.90 pence on Amazon. Hopefully, hopefully there's enough left there to buy it. But it's, uh, to be fair, it's, it's actually all for charity. I make nothing. And the boy who died, Tommy, it's all the profits are donated to CRY, which is the Cardiac Risk in the Young uh, charity. So a lot of the things that I covered today, in fact, 87 things by all this bad value are covered in this book, and it's on Amazon. So if you shout, if you um, Amazon my name, whatever, you'll find it there, and I'll be much appreciated. And, uh, and let me know what you think. But we've covered a lot today. I know I went through a lot of different things on the training side, and for me, it's all about the purpose, and it's all about creating mindful, thought-provoking solutions, problems for your athletes to find yourself. And hopefully you got one or two things out of that, so thank you very much.